On behalf of the TV festival, I would like to welcome you all to this talk with Tim Samuels, a British TV journalist who has been called uh, a new Michael Moore without the political agenda. And the belly. And the beer belly as well. Yeah. yeah. But after what happened last night, it could develop a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get to that shortly. Um, during our talk, we will be uh, watching samples from your oeuvre, as the French say, um, and discussing how you uh, employ uh, or use, uh, should we call it happenings, in your TV journalism. Uh, it sounds very Danish. Uh, provocation, happenings? Happenings, provocations, like, yeah. yes, wh yeah. wh whatever. Okay. But because I believe in full transparency, so do you, I suppose. I think we should start off by saying that last night we went on a marvelous mandate. Yeah. <laughs> it really was nice. Yeah. We went to Geranium, sponsored by the Danish TV Festival. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fair to say that, that Tim now is lost in translation as well as lost in digestion. <laughs> uh, we had a menu called the Total Universe. Yeah. The, the full wine menu. I am very uh, close to becoming Danish after that. Uh, it was very much so. I mean, I thought, you know, I spent most of the year watching um, Danish TV. You know, it, it, Danish TV, I mean, you should all be very proud as Danish people that your TV, it's, it's all we watch in Britain now. We don't watch British TV. American TV, forget it. It's all about Danish TV. <laughs> and and maybe, uh, maybe a little bit of Swedish, but not much. So, but uh, th that and geranium. Swedish television is the token black. <laughs> yes, you can say that. Yeah. And and after we from Geranium, uh, we, we took a taxi back to the hotel. This hotel. Yeah. yeah. When the taxi driver stopped, the, the radio was playing "I Will Always Love You" with <laughs> Whitney Houston. Yeah. And and we were hugging. And you and you were you were dressed as an ambassador as well. Yes. You, I, you had these big boots on. Yes. No. No. Yeah. No. Not really. And you were smoking. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but w when I went to sleep. The last thing I thought of was you. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and especially a story you told me about. I think this is interesting because it tells a lot about how you deviate from the normal way of doing journalism. And this story relates to one of the commandments of journalism that you should never attach yourself too closely to a source, uh, a, a character in your, mm -hmm. in, in, in your film, your story, which you have very much done. Yeah, I mean, bordering I, on Stockholm syndrome, <laughs> and, and this picture is uh, uh, proof of that. Please, yeah. please tell us what, what, what's going on here. Well, fu funny enough, la last night when I went to bed, I, I, I didn't think of you. I thought of someone else, but that's that's, that, that's acceptable. Yeah. Yes. Um, th this is the, the the motto of never work with with animals, children, and porn stars, and uh, I, I was doing a film about the porn industry in Los Angeles and, and it was quite a serious film but she she was from Manchester the same part of the world as me and I, I just wanted to save her I wanted to, to liberate her from this this terrible world of porn that she's found herself in making thousands of pounds a day entertaining several men at once in many different extraordinary ways um, so I, we finished filming and I, I thought she had such mainstream talent, she shouldn't be doing this, her agent was awful. So I, I rang my agent in London, I said, you've got to take her on as a client. She could be, she could be big on the BBC. Um, I was to totally deluded thinking that someone could transition from, from being a porn star into a kind of like a gardening presenter <laughs> on BBC One or something. Um, she's, she's still there and she's, I think she just won a porn Oscar, so congratulations. To her. She's a, a business savvy lady. She's very, she's very savvy and, uh, and, very, and, and you, very flexible. And you went, you, uh, 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 and, and you went rollerblading with her. We, we were rollerblading down Venice Beach. Uh, this is part of the, the the documentary. If I could just have a moment to be with her. Um, uh, of course, P yeah. please, please take your time. Yeah. But, but uh, unfortunately, we will not be sampling anything from the, from that program, ha ha uh, Hardcore Profit. Mm which was, is about the business side of, yeah. of, of porn. Um, but to, um, to, you know, to uh, start painting your portrait, you, you were born in 75? Yes. Yes? Yes. A true blue Manchester boy? Yes, this is true. And at a young age, you were already shooting for the stars. 
at age 13, you interviewed Morrissey. Morrissey, yes. Yeah. Morrissey, the lead singer of the Smiths. Uh, I grew up in Manchester, and, and the, the, Manchester isn't a religious city, but we worship Morrissey and the Smiths. And we, you know, the, the uni we had to have the same haircut and walk around with flowers and not eat animals, uh, which was a lovely thing to do. And um, I was a huge Morrissey fan, and he lived quite near me. And, and one night I did a bit of stalking, or investigative journalism, as we call it. <laughs> and uh, Morrissey came out of his out of his house, and I was. 13, wearing my Smith's T-shirt, and I, and I said, can I interview you for my school newspaper? I'm vegetarian as well. <laughs> and Morris, unbelievably, Morrissey agreed, and then two days later, he came round to my flat and spent two hours there, and I asked him stupid questions about whether he ever wore leather shoes and circuses and zoos and animal rights, and uh, we offered him dinner, and he said no, which was a lucky escape, and he, he was the nicest guy in the world. If he had yeah. seen you at uh, Geranium last night, he would have been angry, I think. Well, I was meant to interview Morrissey a few years ago, about three years ago, for the, for the Culture Show on BBC Two. And uh, it, was actually, it, was all, it was all agreed. Tim Samuels meets his childhood hero again 20 years later. It'd gone into the Radio Times, it was published, and Morrissey pulled out. And Morrissey pulls out of most things, so it's not, <laughs> not a huge surprise. But I, I found out afterwards that what had happened was Morrissey Googled me before the interview and found I'd written an article years ago when I was at university about giving up vegetarianism. Ah. And he was really upset with me <laughs> and cancelled the interview. So if he'd seen me at Geranium last night, he would have been really upset. He would say, here we go again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, But the meat, the portions were small. It wasn't much meat. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But still. Um, you are a very versatile journalist. You do, uh, you do and have done very serious hardcore reporting. You also do cultural affairs on BBC Live Five. You host a weekly radio show, mm. a program about the ordeals of being a man yeah. in a kind of neurotic way. Yeah, yes. a, a neurotic man show. No, yeah. Not about grooming and gadgets. But no, certainly not grooming. We can tell it's not grooming. Yeah, um, it's it's in the uh, BBC Radio had a show called Woman's Hour for 66 years, uh, which is a women's magazine show, and I thought maybe we could possibly have a men's show. And everyone went crazy and said, no, you can't. What do men need a show for? But we got one. And so we, we talk about... We did circumcision recently. And yes. I went to a circumcision, which, which brought That's back... That's always hot stuff. It brought back some memories for me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm sure. So, but your, your, your real... Would, would it be fair to say that your real breakthrough was The Simmers, which placed you on a, on, on a you know, a, a global... Um, yeah, I think it was the first. It was level. the first film which kind of had an international impact. Yes, I think. Yeah. Let's start out by seeing a, a clip from The Simmers, and you came up with the name The Simmers. Yes, I, I mean it doesn't translate very well. It's a very British name. In, in Britain, when old people walk along the street, they're called uh, Zimmer frames. In America, they're called walkers. Here, you call them rollators. Rollators. Okay. So, so in Danish, it would be the Rollators. It would be, yeah, imagine a band called the Rollators. Yes. <laughs> but for us, it was the Zimmers, which sounds a bit like the Zootons at the time. But. And because of that, you actually met George Clooney. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please um, behold the Zimmers. Okay. I, I really enjoyed the, the the scene where you're shopping with the. The lady mm. who talks a bit like Master Yoda, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's very gentle and sweet. Yeah. But uh, talk us through the, the process. Uh, the Simmers was part of a series called uh, Power to the People. Yeah. Which was? It, I mean, it was about taking uh, underdogs. It was about pe taking people who are marginalized, who don't have a voice, and helping them to fight back, but fight back in a way which, which didn't feel worthy, which felt like it was something they might enjoy doing, and, and change them, take them on a journey. And so I, I, with the Zimmers, I'd always wanted to do something with old people and, and, and try and change the way we look at old people and, and highlight how badly they're treated. But I didn't want to just kind of leave them feeling like old people at the end of it, where you turn up and you film them and isn't this awful, this is awful, yes, this is awful. And they feel just as bad as at the beginning. I wanted to do something which took them on a journey and showed that they had this kind of older people have this inner potential which, which we ignore. So and you really took them on a joyride. I took them on a ride. I mean, originally, the original idea was to try and um, 
break them out of a, an old people's home one night, a bit like The Great Escape, you know, where they're kind of shimmying, going down curtains and kicking mud out of their trousers and stuff. But I then went to an old people's home and realized I'd kill them if I did that. And I had two weeks of anxiety dreams about killing old people. Part of the idea was once we break them out, we'd maybe do, let's do a song together. So we just thought, okay, let's, let's just do the song. <laughs> Uh, but, and, and not take them out the window. But you also went cover undercover in an old, old yes. people's home. Yeah, I mean, to the idea was to was to blend some very serious hard journalism with this. So um, we put an actress um, in an old people's home who pretended to be my uh, my uh, great aunt, and I would go and visit her, and she was filming. She had a, a camera in her wheelchair, and I wore the the uh, bloody Holly glasses with the camera in. And uh, and I'd go and film her, and the stuff was awful. I mean, it was just awful, you know, seeing old people lying on the floor, being uncared for, and sat in their own piss, and oh, it was, it was so depressing. Um, but then trying to take some of those people that you find and bring them together in the band. So it wasn't just old people that could sing, it was the old people who we'd met in old people's homes, in tower blocks, who were, who were lonely, and brought them together. And, and how did you cast, that is a very cynical, Word, mm. I know, but how did you cast for the Sibbers? Well, that was it. There, there wasn't really any casting. It was, here are the people we've met along the way from the different um, places w where we've been filming them, and let's bring them all together. The only worry is none of them could sing. <laughs> I mean, it was a real... We got to Abbey Road the day before for a rehearsal, and I thought, this is great, but old people can't sing. <laughs> um, so we had, we had, like, the voice coaches come in from, like, like an X Factor program, But fortunately, Alf, who, who was our singer, had done some amateur dramatics when he was younger. And I was sat behind him in the, in the rehearsal listening. I thought, thank, thank God, Alf can sing. Pushed Alf forward and said, okay, you're Roger Daltrey. Yes. <laughs> There's Roger Daltrey here. But um, how, you know, having, doing a program with old people, was that difficult within the BBC? Um, It's difficult to get stuff commissioned um, about old people because although most people that watch TV are old <laughs> and most of the demographic is over 65 or over 55, commissioners want to attract the younger demographic. I'm sure it's the same in, in Denmark. And no one likes to admit that their audience is old. So it's, it's quite difficult getting old people commissioned. And um, you know, I'm trying to do some new stuff at the moment around old people. And it's, it's, it's difficult to get away because it's, it's, not, it's not seen as the most attractive age group to appeal to yeah. there was some health we used to have to take nurses with us as well and and stop for regular breaks but that, i mean i need that anyway so that's some, some special logistics <laughs> yeah that's yes. fine by me so well, what happened with the simmers afterwards so some of them are not alive today i suppose no i mean no. They, they they were pretty old um i mean the most the, the thing which i've taken most pleasure from isn't isn't the kind of the global thing and the george clean i mean that's fun but it was it was the fact that afterwards they remained a group of friends um, and the band continued and th they'd gone from having kind of quite depressing social life to staying together and they, they had lots of regular events they'd meet up they'd go to bingo together yeah. the band stayed together and they really had a pop chart hit yeah yeah and they, they put an album out um i mean that some of them i mean they, they died i mean they, they um winifred was 101 alf was 91 but the Alf's funeral was was a really very moving. Alf, who was our lead singer, when he died, the, the 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 church was full of just the other band members, and the vicar was quoting from Who lyrics. And when the coffin went through the to be cremated, she played uh, Alf singing My Generation, and everyone danced. And it was a really uplifting, emotional experience. It didn't. It wasn't a depressing funeral. It was a. It was a. It was a really inspirational funeral. I'm sure you're familiar with the question. But did it change anything? Did, did, did it, you know, matter in, in regards to how people think of? I don't know. And then, I know it changed. It changed their lives. Uh, like any, you know, we, we're all very idealistic in this business. Deep down, we think we can change. Very, very much so. You know, as much as cynical as we think we are, we're, we think we do this because we can make a difference. We can change things. And I think I, I felt at the time it did. You know, it did. Uh, you know, it was shown at the United Nations and. Apparently Tony Blair discussed it in cabinets once and uh, there was a sense of, uh, you know, people coming up to me and saying, oh, I've gone to see my elderly neighbor now because I've seen that. I hope somewhere, it, you know, it sounds some good. 
did anybody copy the, the project? Were there like spin-off simmers in, in other countries? I've, I've heard there has been, but I'm not sure where. Pro probably South Korea, where, where for some reason yeah. we were huge in South Korea. You, you went big in South Korea. Big in South Korea. Uh, I had a, there was a really f extraordinary occasion. I got out of a taxi with Winifred, who was she was 99 at the time. We got out of a taxi at the BBC, and we got jumped on by three different South Korean TV crews. <laughs> Not uh, not just one, three South Korean crews. Yes. So. A, a, a little longer on, we will be uh, seeing a clip from another project from uh, the Power to the People series about soldiers, mm. uh, veterans. Uh, but if let's go back to the the beginning of this um, kind of journalism where you you involve involve people and you know, involve them, engage them in, in, in happenings and, mm. and, and activism, which is um, a documentary you did about dirty hospitals. Yes, yeah. Which uh, won you the uh, Banff Award for, for Best Documentary. Mm. Let's see a clip from that. Okay. <laughs> Tim Samuels. Later on, a friend of you began dating the spin doctor of the health yeah. secretary. yeah. Yeah. And she was hating your guts. She, yeah, she wasn't keen. Um, and, and the guy who is refusing to have a nose swap, he goes, goes next door to do yes. it. He is the health secretary he's now. now. A, he's now a health secretary. And the guy at the beginning is now also a government minister because of the coalition. So. But, what people need to understand is that the teams doing the cleaning, they are former patients. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a problem in Britain particularly with, uh, we have very dirty hospitals. Uh, if you get ill in Britain, I suggest you, you ring SAS and fly back. Um, despite what the opening ceremony of the Olympics had with the NHS, it's more like the floor that you saw there, but um, though it's got better. And people were catching really, really deadly diseases from, from these dirty hospitals. And they, and they um, so we formed, a, um, I formed a, an army of cleaners who were made up of people who had had MRSA, this disease, or had had family members who died from it because the hospitals weren't clean enough. So there's a very kind of serious point there about why our hospitals aren't clean. And at that time, they, the hospitals were given advance notice saying, we're coming to inspect your hospital next week, at which point they spend the next week going crazy cleaning and painting it. So when they turn up, it was fine. So we just decided to descend without warning with these people who all, who, whose lives had been so affected by dirty hospitals and do this guerrilla cleanup. And, and they found, as you saw, that the hospitals were really very dirty. The thing with the politicians was, it said that one in three people carry this uh, form, this bacteria up their noses. But, but the, the no swap should be standard operating procedure whenever interviewing uh, politicians from now on, yeah, I think. I think yes. so, yeah. It, it really works well. You should try it with the uh, Danish Prime Minister. Yes, that, that could be fun. Yeah. Um, but and, 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 and the, the film documents how dirty the hospitals are, mm. but, but did that you know, m matter in you know, anybody cleaning them up or...? I mean, it was it was one of those. I mean, it did put pressure on the government because you're 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 showing how, well, uh, you know, it's something which is so fundamental to everyone to be able to go to hospital and not get more ill than when you come in. And people were people were going to hospital and coming out without a leg mm. or something. They, they they'd lost. It was a flesh eating virus. Or dead. Or dead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a kind of uh, a joke. So to go in there and show how dirty the hospitals were. Um, was, was, was quite important. We, I mean, we filmed in a Dutch hospital, which was, uh, it was like going to Ikea. It was amazing. Yeah. We went in there, it was beautiful. And, and, and uh, at the time, if you'd come from England, they'd put you in an isolation ward before <laughs> treating you because <laughs> They because did that in hospital. Dutch hospitals? In the Dutch hospital, yeah. Uh -huh. That's funny. Yeah. So um, let's move on to uh, another, uh, another episode you did for uh, in the, the Power to the People series about soldiers, mm -hmm. veterans. At, at what year did you um, did you finish that? Gosh, I think it was about four, four, five years ago. Yes, I mean this was based around the fact that again it was a, it was, it was the idea of championing underdogs, and, and at, at the time there was a sense in which we were sending uh, our troops off to fight in Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and previously in Falklands and Bosnia. 
but we, we, we do a really bad job at looking after our troops when, when they come back. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's similar here, but you know, people would come back from these war zones and not be given decent aftercare. Um, so to try and highlight that, I brought together soldiers who all felt they'd been abandoned by Britain, and I formed a platoon with them. And the idea was that we'd try and pull off one last mission as, as the platoon. Let's uh, see a sample. <laughs> What happened with uh, the statue? So um, we have statues all over London for, to commemorate all the great battles we've won. Um, I don't think we've beaten Denmark, but we, you know, mainly the French that we've, that you, we've you beaten. You pretty much bombed all of Copenhagen. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and stole the Danish Navy. Right. Again, apologies for that. Um, maybe I should put up a statue here to uh, apologize to the Danish people. But the, the, we have statues for animals in war. We, but the idea, we don't have anything to, to commemorate uh, our, our soldiers who, who've been uh, neglected and we fought for. So we, we made our own statue. And it, was, it was based on the face of a guy who'd come back from Iraq um, with facial injuries. And we, we molded it on his face and turned it into a, a two-ton statue. Um, and then tried to put it up next to Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square by in invading. Um, we had a decoy of 100 old soldiers who marched on the other side, because when you see 100 old soldiers marching, it looks legitimate, it looks kosher. So no one stopped us, and we just drove a truck on and lifted off the statue and um, had, a, had a ceremony for our soldiers. And, and then what happened with... With the statue. Well, we then hit BBC uh, Health and Safety. Uh, we wanted, to, we left it there for a bit, um, but we were forced to to take it away. It's a classic case of uh, asking forgiveness instead of permission. Yes, it was easier to put it there and then take it away than it we couldn't ask permission. It, it must be very difficult, you know, criticizing you are arguing with your journalism because you team up with the underdogs. Yeah. That must be a very that's, comfortable that's, position. That's the secret, yeah. Yes. Uh, if, you know, if, if someone criticizes you, you push forward a granny or a war veteran, <laughs> and you say, it's, it's about them, it's, I'm empowering them, it's, it's not me. So um, that, that, that does help, yeah. yeah. I mean, there have been things I've done where I, I don't have that, and you feel a bit naked, <laughs> and you get, just get criticized. As with the Scottish incident. The Scottish incident was... Uh, a few years ago, during the, the Football World Cup, there were people being uh, beaten up in Scotland for wearing England football shirts, which isn't really acceptable. Um, so I, I, I got a car and covered it in, in, the, uh, in England flags, and I wore an England uh, T-shirt. And We drove around Edinburgh and Glasgow for two days, playing uh, football's coming home. Um, and in Edinburgh, it was fun, and everyone just shouted, kind of friendly abuse. I mean, very offensive, but friendly abuse. And in Glasgow, we left the car near the uh, Celtic football stadium on a Friday afternoon at 3.30. By four o'clock, the car had been destroyed, <laughs> and we'd, we'd filmed it, um, which I thought was legitimate journalism, but the Sc Scottish Parliament uh, had other views. They, they were very angry at you. Very angry with me, very angry. So angry that we showed the piece again. <laughs> but yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, You are no longer employed in the BBC. Yeah. W okay, that sounds worse than. No, it no, is. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not. I, I'm not yeah. implying anything. Yeah. But it leads me to ask, you know, the way the BBC works today, with you know the rules of ethics and yeah. do's and don't, is is what you're, you're, we have showcased here. Would that be possible producing that today within the BBC? That's a really good question. Um, I'd like to think so, but it depends on the on the resolve of the senior managers. I mean, I hope so, because the guy who's now the director general, the new boss of the BBC, was my uh, boss at the time. He commissioned the Zimmers and Trafalgar Square. And so I, I hopefully, I mean, he was a great, he was a great guy and had, he, had, uh, he had big balls. Uh, hopefully that, that would exist, but there's, there's always so much procedure to go through. Yes. But I, I, le I left being staff there to go freelance, though I still mainly work for them, just to have more freedom to, to be able to do stuff I want for America or, or, or elsewhere. Yes. And currently you are working on a major documentary, feature-length documentary about the business of killing people. Yes. Yes. Um, I am, I'm not filming it. I'm, I'm in a, I want to do something for the cinema, which I've not done before. Um, and it works the other way. You have to get the funding before you film. You have to fundraise. <laughs> 
where instead of the BBC just saying, here you are, go and make it. Um, but I really want to do a kind of big documentary on the death penalty, which is something I've filmed as a journalist for the BBC's news, evening news, news night programme on and off for years and, and feel very strongly about. And I've, you know, I've sat with people on, in, on death row who I know are innocent, uh, you know, a particular guy from London who is, is without doubt uh, innocent. And I've, I've, I've sat with people who uh, were with him at the time of the murders and, and he, you know, he couldn't have done it. And um, I've, I've filmed people who are very mentally ill who are being medicated uh, to be sane enough to kill, because you can't kill the insane. So you, but you can drug someone to make them just sane enough to kill. So it's something I feel very strongly about. I want to try and gather together the money to, to make a big documentary agitating around, around the death penalty and, and why America is, is still killing. Let's watch uh, the trailer. So yeah, so this is a bit of the trailer, yes. um, which I'm using to go around and, and, and get Krona. Yes, L lots of Krona, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. yeah. One of the main characters of the film is to be this um, Indian British businessman mm. who has been on death row in the States. Yeah, he's been in jail for uh, 26 years, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it implies that you are actually tracking down the, the real killers? Yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, uh, this is the guy I was saying who, you know, uh, I think is, <laughs> is deeply innocent. Um, he didn't get the fact he, he was convicted for murder in Miami um, in 1986. At the trial, the, the judge himself was arrested and handcuffed and taken out of his own court three days into the trial for uh, bribes. Um, the replacement judge came in and said, oh, let's draw up the death penalty. But before he'd actually been found guilty, <laughs> um, there were six people who say I was with him at the time of the murders. They weren't ever called to court. So... Uh, it's you know it's fun. I mean I, I I read his story again for the BBC last month for the news programs. It, it's still there, no chance of any um, clemency or uh, humanitarian effort at the moment. But it's it's you know America's not the sort of place you want to end up in jail without money if you're if you're innocent. No, definitely not. No, Denmark fine. Yeah, P probably. Yeah. How do you you know? Um, Deploy yourself or, or, um, or use yourself as a, as a character in, 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 your, in your films and, and, and TV series? How, how you know, conscious are you about how you come across? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it, I think it depends on, on the film and what, what, what role you, you need to play. Sometimes it's just to step back and, if, and, let, and just empower people and let them take the stage. You know, if it's if some of the old people, it's just to, to give them a push. Other times it's much more provocative where you're in there tackling a politician or trying to swab them or, you know, or, or really take them on. So it, for me, it's, it's, it's just driven by what the journalism requires. If it, if it requires you to be facetious and obnoxious, then so be it. If at other times you have to be lovely and help people, then, then, then act like that, like that. So, so you, you don't, you know, work with costumes, you know, appearances, uh not like you. No, no. <laughs> uh, I think. No, I once uh, I went to Malawi where you have to you have to wear a tie. It used to be illegal for men not to wear ties, and you could be, uh, uh, I think, fined or imprisoned for not wearing a tie. So I had to wear a tie for that. But that's about as much dressing up. I mean, I, you know, I pr I prefer to just be a bit scruffy and normal yes. because it, it it then politicians or people you're interviewing don't expect you to be as savvy as you might potentially be. Yeah. So if you should, you know, reduce the way of how you're working to, you know, some bullet points, um, what would that be? What is the, the essence of your wisdom as a TV journalist? Um, it would be to remember that we bombed Denmark before speaking to a Danish TV <laughs> audience yeah. and, yes. and keep apologizing. Um, it, 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 for me, it, it's about finding the what's the most creative way to bring the story to life, um, and it's not being stuck in a formula. So, and also finding people where you genuinely care and you genuinely feel that you can make a difference, um, where there are underdogs, where there are people who who could 
he he genuinely wants it to, to you want to help and you want to make a difference and things could be different and you can show that there is another way you know our old people don't have to be treated that way our soldiers don't have to be neglected our hospitals don't have to be dirty these aren't ridiculous policies to come up with they're, they're, they're very reasonable and why aren't we doing them so it, it's, it's to find something which feels as though it, it's real and it, and it should be happening and many of your idea, ideas are easily transferable to Denmark as with what you did with Polish people yes if you could tell about that that was also part of uh, power to the people that, that was sort of a, uh, afterwards yes. um, a few, I don't know, about three years ago we were very uh, concerned in Britain about the number of Polish people who'd come over I know, I know in Denmark you have no immigration concerns at all, so you, 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 won't, understand, you won't understand this. Yes, But we, right we, on the money. Yeah, we were, we were very concerned. Um, uh, well, we, the, the newspapers were very concerned, so I made a film about the Polish immigrants who were coming to Britain and, and sort of showing their side, really. I, I got on the bus and did the 25-hour bus journey um, to the middle of England, worked with them picking fruit on the farms and showed the other story of, of the people who were very concerned about this. But we also had a little bit of fun where we, the, the Poles are very concerned uh, back in Gdansk, the shipyards, that they didn't have enough workers. They were bringing in Koreans to work in the shipyards. And at the time, they were trying to build the football stadiums for the championships we just had. So we brought the mayor of Gdansk over to a small town called Peterborough. No need to go there. Um, to try and persuade the Poles of Peterborough to go back with him. So we set up this meeting and we served lots of Polish delicacies. Um, just sauerkraut and potatoes and ham and more ham. And vodka? We did have vodka, yeah. 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 And, we, and then we brought the, the mayor of Gdansk on and he made this very impassioned plea about how Poland needed you and could you come back to work. At the end, it's like, who's going to come back and work with me? And no one did. No one put their hand up and they all went off to earn more money yeah. uh, being in very, very good builders and plumbers in London. L let's do some uh, Q&A. Okay. If there are any questions for Tim Samuels. I'm sorry, that's very Protestant. Yes. Yes. Th okay. There must be some questions. Uh, or abuse. Uh, abu abuse is fine. Don't worry. We have a question here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, have you had any legal issues or legal, um, uh, you know, affairs going on years mm. after you've done the uh, film? Um, fortunately, I'm going to have to touch wood at this point. Um, not for years. No, we have, I mean, we've got... I guess with the BBC stuff, it, it's very, very legal before it goes out. Um, so particularly if you're accusing someone on national, international television of probably being a murderer, <laughs> you have to be quite careful, of, you know, in coming up with uh, a sort of legal dossier to suggest that there's enough evidence for that. Um, but no, fortunately, no. It, we, we have a lot of legal problems making the shows. And also we have you know, there's very strict editorial guidelines about fair dealing and treating people fairly and not misleading them. Um, and, and, no and swapping them in a fair and balanced way? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did something where I invaded the centre of London with a village which was dying out and we brought all the sheep and the cattle up and we invaded Islington, which is where Tony Blair used to live. And I managed to trick the mayor of Islington to giving me permission on camera the week before by saying, wouldn't it be great if, if, if it was like the old days and we still had sheep here? She said, yeah, it would be amazing. And I said, so I've got your permission to bring some sheep back. She said, yeah, sure. A week later, I turned up with a farm and we invaded. But, you know, to be fair, on camera, she'd given me permission. That is true. Yeah, she had. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Let's call it a, a wrap. But you will be here until Friday, and tomorrow you are hosting a workshop. Yes. No, I think t uh, tomorrow morning I'm doing a workshop about um, different kind of anarchic ways of telling news stories, and I think we're going to play around with the idea of, of, of Danish bacon. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's tomorrow morning. Smashing. Yeah. But th thank you, Mads. And, uh, you know, thank you, you Tim. You, you did, you've, I watched The Ambassador this week, and I, I adored that. So it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Samuels.